Welcome to Radio Free Sunroot. You're listening to the interview podcast, Voices for Nature and Peace, where we discuss issues of ecology, empire, justice, and consciousness. We feature a variety of guests who are aware of the challenges of our time and who are working to address them. Here's your host, Calibri Ter Sonnenblum. Episode 4, Welfare Ranching, with guest Katie Fite. As the Biodiversity Director of the Western Watersheds Project, biologist Katie Fite has monitored more public ground than arguably any other single person in the Western United States. Her work has repeatedly set her against the anti-environmental bureaucrats at the Bureau of Land Management and the Forest Service. She is currently the Director of Public Lands at Wildlands Defense, an Idaho-based organization that is dedicated to protecting and improving the ecological and aesthetic qualities of the wildlands and wildlife communities of the Western United States for both present and future generations. Wildlands Defense engages in legal and administrative advocacy, scientific research, wildland and wildlife monitoring, and by encouraging active public engagement. Katie and I talked on March 9, 2020, and took a deep dive into what is known as welfare ranching. What's that? Well, the sepia-toned myth of the self-reliant cowboy is just that, a myth. In reality, the cattle industry of the Western U.S. receives big subsidies from the federal and the state governments at taxpayer expense. The big losers in this boondoggle are native wildlife and natural ecosystems, many of which now find themselves on the brink of extinction or collapse. It's well past time to remove all cows and sheep from all public lands, period. Well, hello, Katie. Thank you for coming onto my show today. I appreciate it. You are, are with uh, Wildlands Defense, based in Idaho. I know that there's a lot of different issues that you're dealing with, but I wanted to start today by talking about what you and other activists often refer to as welfare ranching. Hopefully you can just tell us a little bit about what that term means. The first time I remember hearing it was in the days, I believe it was the Clinton administration. Don't quote me on that, though. When, you know, there were the, you know, the Republicans in Congress were hooping and hollering over, you know, need, the need to cut welfare, the need to cut welfare, whatever. For those of us who worked on Western public lands grazing, you know, and looked at the huge subsidies in many ways of, the, of livestock forage for almost free, predator killing for free, weed spraying for free, essentially on the lands where the ranchers get the whole public lands grazing permits get to graze for typically a dollar thirty-five a month. Sometimes the grazing fee goes up twenty cents or ten cents or whatever, but basically for a ludicrously low price set by an arcane formula. You know, it was like, well, if we want to talk about government welfare, let's start looking at public lands ranchers in the arid west who are doing so much damage to the lands everybody owns, yet are paying essentially next to nothing for the privilege, and it's a privilege, it's not a right. Never let a rancher tell you they have a grazing right. It's a privilege um, to graze on public lands. That's great, that's a great start. Um, so when we talk about, uh, let's, let's get into a couple of those details there. When we talk about the fees that they're paying, so the ranchers are paying a fee per head of cattle per acre, uh, per month, I believe you said, uh, for public lands. And these are BLM, uh, Bureau of Land Management Lands and Forest Service, both? Yeah. And if, and AUM is what the, the BLM calls it, animal unit month. And that's essentially the amount of forage a cow or a cow-calf pair or a bull can eat in a month or five sheep in all their lambs. So basically a sheep on public lands is, you know, the ranchers paying, I don't know, 30 cents, whatever it would be <laughs> per month for the food the, the 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 sheep eats for the water that's grossly polluted by the livestock waste, et cetera, and, and that the, the animals use and fowl and everything else. And then the Forest Service calls them head months, 
but it's basically the same concept of the, you know, the amount of forage that the, that, that a cow calf pair and or, you know, five sheep eat in a month. Right. So, so if a rancher of either cows or sheep were looking to lease land per acre from a private land hold, landholder, they'd be paying a lot more than $1.25 a month per head. Oh, yes, yes. And see, I know New Mexico has a lot of state land. Idaho has state land. Oregon has state land. Nevada doesn't have state land because they essentially gave it back long ago. Uh, you right. know, even though, you know, the, like the Bundy crowd and, you know, some of the welfare ranchers clamor, you know, that the land should belong to the state, you know, in, in Nevada. It's just absurd. But that's a side note. But anyway, yeah, there's state land, even for for leasing and it's a different concept with state lands there you the ranchers lease the state land they um typically for a period of 10 years and at least in idaho it's a com competitive bidding process to get a lease but usually it's anywhere from five to ten dollars an animal unit month or a head month and that's really undervalued too because on private lands, the ranchers would be paying even more, 20 or $30 typically a month for having a cow or five sheep on private lands. And, of course, you know, the, the states, it's lower than sort of the market value really would be because of the tremendous political power that ranchers hold. And the tremendous political power that ranchers hold at every level is why, you know, the federal uh, grazing fee is set so low and why we have this Byzantine and pretty much um, barbaric system of public lands grazing taking place that continues to ravage our watersheds, spread weeds everywhere, um, and decimate native plant and animal populations across the West with no consequences. Right. So it's welfare in several different ways, one of which is that, you know, we who own the BLM land and the National Forest land are leasing it to the ranchers for far less than it's worth. And then another way is that the ranchers are then doing a lot of damage to this land that we own, and they're not having to pay for that either. That, that's correct. And oh, a decade or so ago, I think the Center for Biological Diversity did a report on the the amount it costs taxpayers just basically to process grazing permits, which is just basically the BLM to do its administrative work. It's basic, you know, the basic stuff BLM does is like six times the amount that the taxpayers ever get back in grazing fees. And that sum doesn't um, include, you know, the cost to BLM doesn't include the predator killing, the weed spraying, the, oh my God, the cows are trashing, you know, the rare fish habitat. We're down to 10 fish, so we got to build this big, long, narrow barbed wire fence so we don't exclude the cows from too much area in order to try to save this last little remnant habitat of fish. It doesn't include anything like that. And it doesn't include any calculation at all of sort of the values that are lost to the public, like the, you know, the values of water that gets permanently lost from a stream network because of overgrazing, I don't even like that term, just because of relentless grazing, erosion, downcutting, and eventually the sustainable perennial flows diminish, so there's less water. It doesn't include any kinds of losses like that or losses of losses of sage grouse populations and whatever value those might have to the public for aesthetic and, and you know, you know, other reasons. Wow. So this is really a boondoggle on one level. And then on another level, it's just a brutal pillaging of the land itself. Yes, that's right. That, that's exactly right. And the ranchers, you know, you, you, you've seen, I'm sure, uh, your, your typical high country news or whatever article where the reporter shows up, the ranchers out there putting, you know, looking like a rancher on a horse, whatever, you know, cowboy hat, and, you know, talking about how much he cares, he or she cares about the land, how, you know, they're the fifth generation rancher, yada, yada, yada. And usually it's in this, you know, cow or sheep devastated landscape. And so it's like this great 
huge scam that's been uh, perpetrated on the American public by the, the Western public lands livestock industry. And it is indeed an industry in every sense of the word. It, it's, you know, the aim is to maximize the number of cows out there. It doesn't matter the damage to the land. And those ranchers will tell you that's not, that not, not their aim. Um, I challenge anybody who says that to really look at what happens when BLM or the Forest Service tries to issue a decision cutting back livestock numbers. It's like the world has ended. The expression here in Idaho, I, at Larry Craig years ago was a, um, you know, a fairly notorious environment hating senator. It was like the ranchers had Larry Craig on speed dial, essentially. <laughs> you know, you when know, BLM tried to do anything to their permit, God damn it. You know, they just went right to the senator. Right. Um, and I'm not exaggerating at all. Right. And I've read just a little bit about this. I've read, uh, I believe, uh, Worthner wrote a book. I can't remember who the co-author was about welfare ranching, who talked about how the history of ranching in the West, of course, actually precedes the United States because it was started by the Catholic missionaries bringing in uh, mm -hmm. cattle through the Southwest. So the ranching was already going on and the control of local governments by ranchers was already going on when, for example, parts of the West were still part of Mexico. So when they got taken over by the United States, they still got to keep their land. The land grants from Mexico just got grandfathered over, so to speak. Uh, and those people then became the foundation of the first the territorial governments and then the state, uh, what would become the state governments. Yes, yes, that's exactly right. And law professor at the University of Wyoming, Deborah Donahue, has written a great paper on this. And the title of the paper sort of encapsulates it all. It's, if I remember it correctly, it's about the whole concept of capture. It's that it's a capture of grass, ground, and government by... Western public lands ranchers. And guess how many Western public lands ranchers there really are? Oh, gosh, that's a great question, because I haven't, I haven't looked into that. I mean, you know, well, if it's all a bunch of uh, small family ranchers, then there must be millions of them, right? <laughs> no, it's not all small family ranchers. <laughs> and it's not, there's not millions of them. Um, BLM permittees, it's around 18,000 BLM permittees, and maybe uh, and I may be off a couple thousand because I have a terrible head for remembering numbers, maybe five or six thousand Forest Service permittees. I'll look up the, the numbers after we talk and get back to you if they need corrected. But anyway, it's this tiny number of individuals, but they have such a good deal gone because they've been in place. You know, the, you know, the ranchers, you know, are, are get elected to the county commission, et cetera, et cetera. And all the history like you described, you know the laws at the state level, et cetera, and at the federal level, level, they've had the power to get the laws written so much to their advantage all this time that they have pretty much a chokehold on Western public lands policy related to livestock grazing. And they spend a lot of effort these days in trying to brainwash the public. Here in Idaho, if you turn on the public radio station, you get this, you know, very, very frequently, this little blurb that says, brought to you by the Idaho Rangeland Resources Commission. Basically, you know, the working so the public and ranchers share the public lands wisely, yada, 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 as if it's all happiness there, as if somehow we, the public, you know, have to sort of accommodate the ranchers too when it's our land and they've, shown time and time and time again by the tremendous damage that's done by the species numbers that keep going down, 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 and their resistance to cutting back grazing in really any way, shape, or form that they don't deserve this privilege at all. I had no idea it was such a small number of individuals. I knew it was low. I felt since I started paying attention to this that on a per acre basis, in the Western states, ranchers are probably the most destructive people that there are, even more than, than miners or loggers, simply because a given rancher has a power over so many hundreds or even thousands of acres. And the other thing, too, is that 
it's very hard. It's increasingly hard to trace who actually is running the cows on public lands because oftentimes there'll be names like Cherry Creek Limited Liability Corporation. Well, who's Cherry Creek LLC? You know, unless you live in the local area, it's often hard to figure out who's running cows. And there's very large corporate entities running cows. For example, Simplot is you know, the, the um, largest public lands grazer. The last time that, you know, those numbers were tallied, and that was, you know, quite a while ago, just simply because it's difficult to track. But, I, I, you know, they, they still retain all those, you know, huge, uh, huge acreage allotments, especially here in southern Idaho, portions of northern Nevada, and some in eastern Oregon, a little bit in Utah. And so they oftentimes are multi-state operations. If you look at, I mean, this is, this is something that will blow people's minds, really. Okay, if you've read about the rapacious gold mining that goes on in Nevada, a large area of north central Nevada, it's just a whole series of huge cyanide heat leach gold mines. These mines dig pits way down deep so that the water table, you know, the springs up above the level of where the bottom of the mine pit is actually drain down into the pit. The whole the whole water table drops down. Well, anyway, the mines end up buying up ranches for the water rights because the mining is disrupting the water so much. And with those mo- with those ranches come public lands grazing permits because the ranches were base properties for the grazing permit. So, th- so that means Barrick and Newmont and uh, other huge mega mines then turn around and hire a ranch manager and, a lo- you know, and graze huge numbers of livestock across public lands. And both those entities, both Barrick and Newmont, graze, you know, close to a million acres of public lands. Um, and so you would think that, okay, here's this mine just completely disrupting the ecosystem in so, so many ways. Wouldn't it make sense when BLM permits a new mine that they basically terminate the public lands grazing permit and say, hey, you know, we're, you know, grazing should not continue as mitigation for the huge amount of damage your mind's going to do. We're going to basically retire the grazing allotment. But no, it doesn't work that way. It's just (laughs) complete rapaciousness. Right. There's a very similar situation going on where I'm currently staying. uh, I'm staying on a rural property on the Gila River in southwestern New Mexico, Uh, just like I mean, I'm not on the river, but I'm on one of the irrigation ditches that goes on the side. And there's pasture, irrigated pasture, irrigated by the river, uh, that's going on, you know, uh, 50 yards from where I'm sitting right now. And I found out shortly after uh, moving here that the uh, that this is ranching being done by the mine in, in Silver and nearby Silver City. Mm-hmm. For that exact mm-hmm. same reason, they're just trying to hold on to the water rights. And so what should be an intact wetland ecosystem for the sandhill cranes and all the other birds who are around here, you know, and of course, all the native uh, flora that they would be eating is is constantly being grazed by these cattle and can't, um, it isn't anything like it should look like. And of course, all the water is channelized mm-hmm. as well, you know, so the river is no longer yeah. meandering back and forth like it needs to you know uh the the flow has changed uh it's constantly messing with and then to find out that this isn't even just for the the business of of selling some cows this is actually just the cows are here just for the mine and the mine doesn't want to shut down because as soon as they shut down they're required by federal law to start cleaning up their operation (laughs) right and that's far too expensive, right? So they're basically running a skeleton crew at their mine. They're not making any money off the mine, but they would lose a lot of money and have to spend a lot of money if they closed it down. So this land is being raped out of my window here every day because this company doesn't want to clean up their mess. I have kind of a daily reminder Mm -hmm. of what a a mess this is. Yeah. And it's the twisted, the twisted 1800s era laws that sort of, you know, determine the fate of public land and fish and wildlife on them. It's just, you know, shocking. Once you look at what really goes on in the West on public land and how basically the ranchers, the miners and the loggers game the system and 
you know, aren't held to any any level of accountability, really. It takes, you know, tremendous abuse. I mean, many, many years, extensive BLM or Forest Service efforts to ever document enough trespass damage that a grazing permit would ever be canceled on public land. I mean, you have to be just an extreme abuser, you know, like Clive and Bundy or like Wayne Hage, you know, to ever have that happen because the laws are so lenient and the agency people that are supposed to be enforcing the laws run, you know, head on into the political power of the ranchers. And it doesn't matter what the admin, who's in, you know, who's in the, in, in the white house or what the administration is, that political power is still there. In my experience, you know, it's been, you know, for public lands grazing, when I saw the most accountability and the most real effort to change the system was in the Clinton administration. The Obama administration was a big loss for public lands. And of course, you know, the Trump administration is a disaster. But, you know, it's just like the bureau. The politicians will not stand up to the livestock industry, and partially that's just because of the, you know, easy, easy outs and just the way the media portrays ranchers. It's like, oh, how can you beat up on these salts of the earth, whatever, when the salt of the earth is really a foreign mining corporation from Canada or whatever, <laughs> Right. And then of these 18,000 permit holders for the BLM or the five to 6,000 for the National Forest or, or whatever the number is, like the majority of those are not salt of the earth family farmers, but corporate entities. Well, there still are small ranchers, but in my mind, you know, mining corporations should not be able to hold public lands grazing permits or, you know, oil and gas corporations, if you look at Wyoming. But anyway, both are equally bad, really, because the fifth generation or sixth generation rancher, you know, can be just as abusive as the corporate rancher with, with that hires a ranch manager and the hobby rancher. That's the other part of things too, is oftentimes, you know, people want the uh, illusion of power and importance that comes with big belt buckles and, you know, big impressive uh, tall you know, gate posts, you know, looking like the entrance to the Ponderosa Ranch or whatever. So lots of, you know, lots of very wealthy people have owned public lands ranches, ranches that have public lands grazing permits. And I want to clarify something, too, that we when I used the word base property earlier, the base property, the grazing permits, it's not like you could go out and purchase a grazing permit. You have to buy the actual physical land that the grazing permit is attached to and that's unlike typically this what happens at the state level uh even though you know you're supposed to be a ranch etc etc and that could vary from state to state but anyway it's not something people often get the impression that oh well you know somehow you can go out and buy a permit no it's attached to a particular um piece of land and that has helped that has helped maintain the chokehold over the ranching industry on public lands too. Right. So I wanted to next get into, you had mentioned earlier that one of the other things that the government does is, is help with eradication of wildlife, uh, mainly predators, and then also the spraying. So to bring us to the topic of how is it that ranching is bad for the environment? Well, it pretty much if you look at everything. If I know that's a big question. <laughs> You go outside and stand and, you know, I don't know, what, what are the shrubs that are there? Is there rabbit brush, whatever, you know, and you, or is it, is it a grassland where you are? Is it a forest, sort of a, a mixture? Anyway, you go out and stand outside. Anything, anything from, you know, the ground below the surface <laughs> to you know, the air and everything in between because – what you're talking about is, you know, a thousand pound, typically thousand pound half ton or more, you know, cows that were bred, you know, to put on weight and like to loaf in areas, especially near water, that compact the soil, pulverize the protective living microbiotic soil crust 
that helps protect the soil from erosion in wind and water and also helps to prevent weeds like flammable grasses from invading. And of course, the bunch grasses, the native bunch grasses get really severely grazed by getting eaten back too low. They bake in the sun. They aren't protected in the winter. And it's like any, like a house plant. If you keep chopping it back and chopping it back and chopping it back to where there's not much there, the poor thing's going to croak. And it's, you know, pretty much the same thing with, with, um, you know, native bunch grasses and native wildflowers or forbs, as they're, you know, more more generally called. And then shrubs like in sage grouse habitat and pygmy rabbit habitat, where both those uh, critters really need like the stru- complex structural cover of sagebrush, sage grouse for nesting, pygmy rabbits just for living year round to protect them from predators. Um, but the cattle, just the physical movement of the cattle staggering around, as well as the cows, you know, eating some of the, the shrubs at times, too, simplifies the shrub structure, makes it unsuitable, you know, for, for wildlife in many ways. And then the, the combination of all these kinds of damage to the grasses, to the microbiotic crust, ends up providing the ideal circumstances for weeds to invade. And then the weeds choke out and outcompete the native plant. And so you end up sort of dooming recovery of native plant communities. And then with water, you know, cows, you know, came from, you know, Poland, wherever you know, the ancestral cows came from, where, you know, moister climates, they hang out near water and will preferentially eat any green vegetation over any, you know, dry or coarse or upland grass type of vegetation. And they foul the water. The combination of their trampling and grazing causes serious erosion by, you know, um, destabilizing stream banks. Then when runoff happens, there's not protective cover there to prevent, you know, really scouring erosion and downcutting. Streams downcut, they get divorced from their floodplain, they entrench, the water starts to go away. And so at every level, the cat, and of course, there's the whole climate, cows, big methane producers, you know, climate aspect of, of grazing livestock, plus, the land that's being abused by the cattle and or sheep in so many ways is also itself undergoing climate change stress, you know, hotter conditions. Um, So the moisture doesn't stay in the soil as long, evaporates more. Cheatgrass, you know, the huge, huge problem here in, you know, in the Great Basin and in the, in the shrub step country here in Idaho um, thrives in hotter, drier sites. And cattle grazing helps create hotter, drier sites by eating the vegetation down so it doesn't shade the ground surface as much. It doesn't hear trap windblown snow. And it just completely alters the ability to land to buffer the effects of climate change stress. Right. So there's basically entire pieces of the ecosystem which are either absent at this point or greatly reduced uh, in their distribution than they were prior to ranching. Yes. Yes. Um, And there have been studies, like a a, a recent one, in one of the few larger areas where livestock grazing has been removed for a significant period of time in Hart Mountain. And it was the 1990s when a very brave... um, refuge manager got the cows off Hart Mountain in Southern Oregon and the, and also off of Sheldon National Wildlife Refuge, uh, facing fierce opposition, but studies there that show just the amazing resurgence in um, Aspen communities and riparian habitats, et cetera, and the migratory birds that are using the habitats now that they've been able to regrow and recover from livestock grazing. And there's been many studies 
on, you know, the, the easiest, pl- the easiest places to get recovery from grazing are, pl- are where there's still water left. And so you, you know, the, you have that, the ability of willows or, you know, ripe sedges, you know, on stream banks to recover. Many, many studies showing the improvement of fish habitat and fish numbers, et cetera, in streams where grazing is removed. Right. So basically, across the board, any kind of animal that we can think of from fish to mammals to birds to insects are are all affected because of all the different effects that happen to their to their homes, to their habitats. Yeah, yes. And, you know, I think you we talked a little bit about, you know, uh, predator killing. I mean, predator killing disrupts ecosystems. Predators are killed, large carnivores for ranchers in many places grasshoppers and mormon crickets native insects are sprayed by aphis uh animal plant health inspection service with pesticides because they may be the the grasshoppers and mormon crickets are damaging the range and and large numbers are often the result of degraded land condition and then, of course, herbicide spraying for the weeds that come in in the wake of the cattle and the sheep having ravaged the native plant communities. And the herbicides always have, you know, caused collateral damage, have effects in ways that the BLM and the Forest Service will never admit or consider, and contaminate the, you know, soil, water, and air. So it's, yeah, it's just a nightmare for the arid west to have cattle and sheep in large numbers out here wreaking havoc on the ecosystem at every level right and it's it's many millions of acres altogether of public lands that that they're allowed to have the livestock on and yet within the picture of cattle overall in the united states the cattle on public lands are, I believe it's a very low single digit percent, aren't they, of all of the cows? Oh, yeah. Uh, anywhere from three to four percent at the most um, of, of the beef produced, you know, comes, you know, in, in any way from public lands. And typically, I'm not sure in New Mexico, uh, where there's not the strong, uh, maybe not as strong a seasonality as here, but... When the whole, you know, the whole like base property, you know, how grazing is structured on property lands. Originally, the ranchers were like supposed to have enough private land so they were there would be forage to tide the livestock o- over over the winter. Well, increasingly, that's fallen by the wayside, and there's been this just increased push to have the cows out here virtually year round. So that means they're out like in early, early spring when the soils are just like soup almost. You can imagine the damage done by cows moving around the landscape at that time of year or out in the winter when they're disturbing big game in, you know, in winter habitat in, when, when the, the, the deer or the elk are trying to overwinter. There's been an increased push for that because the public lands grazers are really never satisfied. And in all the years I've been working working on this, like I said before, if anybody believes that the ranchers have the best interest in mind of the land, I dare them to get involved in appealing a BLM grazing decision that the ranchers also appeal. And the ranchers appeal because like BLM wants to cut, oh, maybe 5% of the AUMs on the permit and the environmentalist me appeals because the land beat to death and really significant areas need to be like massive reductions in cows or need to be rested altogether. I dare you get involved in one of those processes and just see how ferociously the ranchers argue to retain every single cow out there. In a state of shock after the war, we interrupt our program for a brief message. If you appreciate this podcast, please consider supporting Colibri on Patreon. Just go to patreon.com slash Colibri. That's K-O-L-L-I-B-R-I. And now, back to our regularly scheduled... (laughs) 
Right. And yet, if we were to have a, a turnaround and just imagine for a moment that we were able to pull all of the cattle off of public lands, uh, being that they're only three to four percent of the total, that it's not as though uh, suddenly beef prices would go up or something like that. And so for the consumer, this is not a significant part of the supplying of, of their food. No. And, you know, and of course, the whole, you know, America's love affair with beef is starting to be reconsidered, too, thankfully. You know, there's this sort of, um, I don't know if you would call it, like this happy agrarian perspective that somehow pasture-fed beef on public lands, essentially, is better for the environment than feedlot beef. My response is both are terrible for the environment, you know, perhaps in slightly different ways, but both are, are just a disaster for the environment and the whole the, the, just the amount of water used to produce a cow, no matter if it's on a feedlot or on public lands, it's just an immense amount of water. And we don't have that, that amount of water to spare. I was just going to say that there's lots of discussions around, uh, you know, meat eating and beef eating. And there's uh, the perspective, you know, there's there's arguments people have about health. You know, some people say that this animal that is the human shouldn't even be eating, you know, meat. Others say that it can be, it's okay. Then there's the ethical questions of whether it's okay to kill animals for food, etc. But I, I feel like because of the environmental costs that are now becoming apparent, we're now seeing that there'll be a point very soon where the ethical discussion and the health discussion are going to be moot because we simply won't be able to afford the beef industry anymore at anything like its current scale. That's right. But my fear, my big fear is that the ranchers, you know, are not going to go peaceably into the good night. That here, what's going on with the cheatgrass, you know, these annual flammable annual invasive weeds that thrive in areas beat out by cows, there's no solution to the weeds the cows are causing. There are actually big areas that are just pretty much expanses of cheatgrass and weeds. And that feeds the fire cycle. The areas burn, and then they're even more susceptible to weeds. And there's no real solution. This huge amount of money, hundreds of millions of dollars or more a year that's being spent on not saving sage grouse, on these insane pinion juniper destruction projects, all those kinds of things, that money's not being used to address these really pressing ecological problems of what are we going to do about cheatgrass? Herbicides are not an answer. The answer has to be some kind of a biocontrol or, you know, whether it be it a rust, a fungus, something. And that should be, you know, an intensive, intensive project where all this money that's being spent on things ranchers like, like tree killing. So there's more grass. You kill the trees. Oh, there's more grass. Oh, I can have more cows. Or, oh, I don't have to have my cow numbers cut. The priorities are all screwed up. More and more land is being ruined, absolutely ruined with no solution in sight each year by continuing to have the cows and sheep out there. And so now what's going on is the ranchers, and you wrote this wonderful uh, article about BLM hoodwinkery with the fuel brakes um, in Counterpunch. And I love that term. <laughs> you know, now BLM, because there's these huge fire problems because of the weeds and because, oh, my God, all the sage grouse habitat is getting trashed and burning up, et cetera, et cetera. BLM wants to put in this massive fuel brake network. And part of what they want to do is go along 11,000 miles of roads, mow off or disc up the sagebrush and other shrubs or, and cut down the juniper trees that might be there and plant a, pretty much exotic grasses for livestock forage. And then at times you use livestock to keep those grasses in check. It's just this huge boondoggle to perpetuate grazing on the landscape, the same thing that's killing the land. It's insanity. Yeah, one thing that's been consistent over 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 the history of, of the BLM and the grazing program is that they will use whatever language they need to in order to create more pasture. Yes, exactly. Like, what is restoration? <laughs> restoration is not what BLM does when it calls, you know, it's 
whacking, chaining, masticating, <laughs> battering and abuse of trees. I mean, restoration. Oh, and the same thing with sagebrush. We're going to go and restore the sagebrush. Well, that means this tractor or caterpillar pulls this crushing whatever <laughs> thing across the land, smashing the sagebrush, um, dribbling out the other exotic, you know, exotic grass seeds or these huge gigantized pseudo native cultivars that have been bred by the agricultural research service service uh, for res restoration even though they really are like two or three times the size of the native plants are really coarse but hey look at the huge livestock forage bonanza they produce and there's an aspect of this too uh, you reminded me when you mentioned the, the pinions there's an aspect of this of this too where a lot of the vegetation that's been destroyed over the last, you know, decades, centuries, whatever it is by the cattle, has been uh, native plants that were food plants for the indigenous people who lived here before the Europeans arrived as well. So the pinions were definitely a staple crop uh, for many tribes in the area, especially in, in Nevada there. I, I've gone and, yeah. and spent time uh, gathering pine nuts by Austin and et cetera. And I also was given a tour in eastern Oregon of public land that had been grazed the previous spring. I was there in the summer, been grazed the previous spring just when the camas was coming up mm. to bloom. And, you know, camas is a seasonal crop. Crop. You know, it comes up in the spring, it blooms, and then it dies yeah. back, right? Well, they brought the cattle in right when the camas was coming up, and it trampled all the camas, right? So it's yeah. a bulb. I mean, some of it will survive. However, it wasn't able to bloom and set seed that year, you know? Uh, and then ironically, uh, the cattle were then moved as part of this program where they were, you know, supposedly uh, protecting land by moving the cattle around, you know? Oh, it, like it holistic grazing right so that's what they said they were doing but ironically what they did was really come to that particular piece at exactly the wrong time for that one to to to, to affect the mm -hmm. canvas and then move it on somewhere else you know i mean if it was going to be included well they, they should have been brought in you know later but they're not looking at that you know and, and i have a lot of contact you know with the wild tending communities who are who are mm -hmm. uh, you know rediscovering and trying to bring into practice uh, a lot of the old ways that happened before because a lot of the tribes did not merely go out and gather they also were were planting they were collecting seed they were planting seed mm -hmm. they were further west in california they were using fire in the great basin they were not using fire that's not a fire adapted ecosystem they knew that you know but they were uh trimming trees they were doing um different things like that and within that community, which is, you know, very small and very fringy, there, there's people there who feel as though the way to deal with the cheatgrass would be to plant into it with uh, native food plants again. Uh, to to, to mm -hmm. simply to simply seed yampa, for example, right back in there, and you know, with the hopes that okay, this will eventually, uh, you know, because it grows in a different way, we'll, we'll shade it out, you know, and also because they're root root perennials, they they tend to hold on to the moisture underneath the surface there in a different way too, which can start to cool the the soil out again, and so so that's the only solution I've heard to cheat grass that doesn't have to do with poisoning or some other eradication. Mm -hmm. but, but I also understand that, that that's, that's kind of far outside of there. And certainly the BLM and the Forest Service have done very little work with tribes or with similar efforts. Well, that, that's very interesting, you know, like the camas. And uh, who knows how much camas, you know, there what once what was in some places. But the down cutting and erosion like, you know, 90% of the, you know, riparian habitat in many areas has been lost in the, in many areas in the West because of the erosion from, from grazing. So just the potential really to have, you know, big expanses of, you know, native food plants has been lost in so many places. But I think, I think you're absolutely right. The only way to really recover some of these areas is you have to start getting the structure there. And with something like the yamp, you know, the, the bulbs or corms, I forget, you know, which they are, but, you know, propagating those and starting to replant those certainly makes a lot of sense.
because everything that has been tried, see, the whole this is the, this is it's been this, you know, you know, white settler farming mentality has been applied to Western public lands and everything BLM and the Forest Service has done, and it's been a huge disaster. This thing has worked because it's been this, oh, well, we'll go out and we'll do this big plant of this or that, and, you know, the way we would plant a wheat field. No, never works. It doesn't work <laughs> when you don't have predictable moisture and you have, you know, insects and you name it out there. Oh, certainly the landscape is, is entirely inappropriate for those, you know, both those animals and those plants. And then on another level, large monocrops of wheat or corn, wherever they are, even if the climate is correct and there's enough water, is still a terrible thing to the environment. This is something that's not uh, well enough understood, is that agriculture at that level is in and of itself uh, destructive. Culturally, it goes back, I believe, uh, to the dominion uh, overall that that you know that's mm -hmm. mentioned in Genesis and the Abrahamic religions there they've got their foundation there in agriculture uh, which is which is an imposition on the land rather than a working with these species on the land as was as was previously done and I mean one place that's really shown in a drastic way in a very sad way I believe too is in the attack uh, you mentioned this before the attacks that that happen on all the predator species for example we have you know the mountain lion we have the wolf and we have the grizzly who are all animals that are greatly endangered primarily because they're seen as enemies of agricultural operations yep and the co and coyotes too and coyotes I mean, so i mean huge numbers of coyotes are killed because they might because the rancher thinks they might look cross-eyed, you know, the sheep or whatever. And Wildlife Services, which is, you know, the federal predator killing agency, they, there doesn't even have to be a depredation. There don't even have to be dead sheep or dead cows. They can actually go out in advance of the livestock being turned out on public lands and conduct scorched earth killing of predators. Just because the ranchers don't want to expend the energy to take care of their livestock and or from my point of view it's like hey you have this great privilege of being able to graze your cows and sheep for almost nothing on public land you should accept any losses from predators as simply a cost of doing business you know you should n never be allowed to request lethal predator control if you're grazing on public lands Right, because don't ranchers also, besides having help eradicating them, don't they also get reimbursed uh, somehow for... They, they get variously reimbursed. They don't get reimbursed, say, if a coyote kills their, their sheep or whatever. They get to write it off as like a loss, a business, you know, a business loss. So who knows how many, you know, sheep that, you know, died because they, they ate something they shouldn't have have been <laughs> written off as a loss, you know, that a rancher gets to take off their taxes. If they pay any taxes, there's so many <laughs> loopholes, you know, and, and ways ranchers can, can account for costs, et cetera, that it's, it'd be very interesting to see how much they actually pay in taxes. And oftentimes, like the private lands that are owned uh, are taxed at rock bottom rates. And it's like it, at the county level and everything else, it's the people that live in the towns who basically pay for the nice gravel road going out to the ranch because the taxes on the ranch land are, are, are mere pittance. It's a racket. <laughs> you know? It's a complete racket. You, you know, you, um, you said, you know, your interests were, you know, in, you know, like environmental issues and also some peace and justice issues. And um, when you said that, I thought, you know, the famous, you know, the Smedley Butler quote about war being a racket. Well, public lands ranching is indeed a racket, too, uh, where tremendous power is involved and it's pretty much cemented in and it's going to take it's going to take pretty much of a revolution and whether climate change and people understanding the effects of climate change really bring about that revolution uh, to really, you know, shake things up and dislodge these freeloaders from the public lands before they destroy everything that's out there. There was one hopeful gleam that I noticed on this issue that happened last year. You might recall that there was the massive flooding in the Midwest. 
and mm -hmm. that was having a big effect on agricultural operations there, right? And there's also obviously a lot of ranching on private and public land that happens there too. And there was such a high number of cows who were killed that they actually pulled a lot of them to market uh, out of Eastern Oregon uh, sooner than, than they usually would. And I, and I had this information from a friend of mine. My, my friend went up to Oregon to, uh, to hang out with some wild tending folks up there. And I believe there was a primitive skills gathering that was happening as well. And it's an area where there's always cows, always cows, always cows. And they noticed, oh, wait a minute, there aren't. Where are the cows? Where are the cows? They asked around and they found out that that was why. It was because huh. uh, the Midwest had gotten hit hard enough by the, the floods and the other situation that they had that they needed the ones from Oregon, right? So, so they were able to sell them even though they wouldn't usually at that time of year. And I thought, huh, maybe, just maybe, the situation with the cows in, in the West is a little less solid than I'm thinking it is. Maybe it would be the first thing to go in a situation where they're trying to keep the beef industry propped up. Maybe that, maybe, I don't know. This is just my, this is just what I noticed from this instant was maybe that would be the, the relief we would get. Of course, that's within the context of like these enormous disasters, which are having their own, their own terrible consequences, you know? Yeah. And, you know, right now there's a, a voluntary grazing permit buyout bill that's been introduced in Congress because the laws are so screwed up when it comes to everything is designed to keep every single cow and sheep on public lands that would allow retirement of grazing permits if they were bought, bought out with private funds. And the livestock industry even opposes that. Uh, right now, if you go out and buy a, a, a ranch and there's a grazing permit attached to it, you can't go to the federal government and say, hey, I want to shut down this allotment. You know, this, this area that my grazing permit is for, I don't want the permit anymore. I don't want the land grazed. You can't say that. It basically has to be grazed. Another rancher could come in if you basically said, gave the, the permit back to the agency and say, hey, I want to graze there, and they would give them the permit. So if the system basically locks in grazing, except for there have been some wilderness bills where the special exceptions that allow grazing permit retirement to take place have been written into them. But those are pretty much the only instances where there's actual certainty that an allotment can be shut down. And what we're seeing now under the Trump administration is there's areas where grazing permits have been bought out in the past, and the agency said, oh, we're not going to graze this. Well, now there's a the pressure to graze them in grizzly bear habitat in Wyoming, in, along the Escalante River in Utah, and other areas. It's now, hey, let's turn the cows back out after private money was spent basically buying out ranchers in order to benefit the land and allow it to heal from grazing, move to dump the cows back out there. So, right. and in my own view, you know, really, truly what needs to happen is the ranchers need to be paying us, the public, reparations that go into, like, restoring the land. They shouldn't get a single penny. They should just be evicted. But the reality is that's not going to happen. So, you know, things like volunteer, you know, grazing permit buyout bills at a small amount, but livestock industry, the National Cattlemen's Beef Association, etc., are strongly opposed to it. They're opposed to making any dent into their essential, you know, chokehold on Western public lands. And all this money that is just being blown away and wasted on destroying beautiful pinion juniper forests. Imagine if that went to buying out, if the federal government said, hey, we've had enough of this grazing. It's trashing everything. It's time you go away. Here's your money, rancher. We'll give you a fair market value. Here's your money. Go buy a ranch in the Midwest, whatever, and or, you know, adjust to the modern world. Use your irrigation water on your private land to grow some kind of sustainable crop, not the completely unsustainable beef that costs, I mean, that uses so much water, whatever. Um, but just imagine if that was happening with that money, that would be a big advance, but that isn't even happening. So, you know, there really needs to be a big shakeup 
entirely in how public lands are managed and viewed. And I think whole new agencies created to do it and get rid of the cows and sheep. Um, so there can be, you know, native plants and wildlife and, you know, indigenous people's food plants, et cetera, out there on the land. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And the fantasy I've had before has been like, okay, because the damage is so severe from this industry and because it needs to end so soon that it would be worth it to be like, okay, let's talk to each of these ranchers and say, you give me a number of how much you would make from now until you know the rest of your life, the next 40 years. You give me that number of what you would make, we'll give you 100 times that amount to just stop now. That's a little too generous, but yes. <laughs> yes, but yes, stop now. Yes, give them some amount of money to go away and give the public back the ability to have clean water and have pygmy rabbits, you name it, out there rather than just have stinking, <laughs> you know, manure expanses and and you know it's just an entirely part of what has gone on is every almost every place is grazed and people go out recreating on public land and they they see what it looks like but they don't realize what it could look like without the cows and sheep the, the you know the how much nicer it really is and so that's a that's a real problem too is that people don't really have this vision of what could be out there because there are so few areas that aren't grazed right in general it's just an unfortunate fact that most people in the united states who live in cities just don't know what's going on in the non-city areas out in the countryside and in the wilderness you know and then when they do go out there they don't realize what it is that, that they're looking at you know uh, you know, I used to live in, in, in Oregon in the Portland area and I was doing farming around there and people used to talk about going out into the Willamette Valley on the weekends and like, oh, it's just so nice to see the countryside. Oh, it's so green, this and that. But after I'd been out there for just a few months uh, farming in, um, in Polk County, I, I realized mm -hmm. that, oh, this is all grass seed country is what this is. And uh -huh. grass seed is, is a terrible crop for the land. They, because it's a non-food crop, they're allowed to use more things on it than you would on a food crop, you know? Grass seed is actually- Really toxic- yeah, well, and, and Christmas tree farming is even worse. That's probably the second, uh -huh. the second biggest uh, crop in the in the Willamette Valley. The first is is definitely grass seed. Over half of the Willamette Valley is all mm. just in grass seed. And by grass seed, I mean for golf courses and for lawns. Like that's what we're talking oh about here, gosh. right? So not even mm -hmm. grass seed to like plant a pasture to feed cows, right? Like not even that. Like just ornamentals mm -hmm. you know that that's what we're talking about you know and so so mm -hmm. so i i learned you know and in that same valley uh you know over 95 percent of the wetlands had either been destroyed or or impacted so mm -hmm. i realized that oh this area that i too once thought was beautiful countryside but, well this is actually just a crime scene is what this is you know mm -hmm. like i had to learn how to look at it that way then i read you know, Werthner's book that I mentioned earlier before, Welfare, Welfare Ranching. And that book was the beginning of showing me how to look at the Western landscapes, the non-agricultural landscapes, especially like the Great Basin, you know, and to see uh, to see those for, for what they are, you know. And that book showed me uh, how to look at a stream and be like, oh, see on a on a mm -hmm. healthy stream, doesn't have cows on it all the time. You have like a, a steep bank, often with a little overhang which is creating mm -hmm. shade, creating shade along the side there. All sorts of things grow there, insects, fish, all sorts of things happen in that shade there. But then when the cows are there on a regular basis, that shelf and that steep angle uh, gets eroded. Now it's just shallow. Now it's like a shallow, almost like a driveway coming down to the street or something, you know? Uh, yeah, and, and, and then it just hot water, everything else from that, the impacts of shallow, flattened out stream. Yeah. And, and another thing that he pointed out was uh, that in some of these areas, in the areas where there is fencing along the road, uh, you can watch, you can be like, oh, what's the vegetation look like on the roadside compared to the grazed side? 
and you'll see mm -hmm. once you're able to recognize which plants are native and which are introduced, then you're able to see, oh, here's the ones that are native. They're simply missing on that side of the fence, you know? <laughs> Yeah. You know, he, yeah. 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 It's just amazing how at every level, you know, and, and like, you know, your experience, you know, in the Willamette Valley with the grass seed, so many streams, like in central Idaho, they never connect to the rivers because they're all diverted to grow cow, not, not crops, but just cow pasture, you know, and I'm sure many, are, you know, the mountainous areas in New Mexico, it's the same thing. The water doesn't even get to the main stem river because it's all being put out on the land to grow cow food in pastures. And so then, you know, downstream, you know, we have all these water crises. Well, let's look at what's going on in the headwaters. And it goes back to livestock. Right. Hopefully listeners have gotten an idea of, of, of how severe the, the the crisis is that's going on and, and so then i would want to turn at this point to to ask so people who are who are so moved about the about these issues now what are some ways that people can try to get involved or try to help in in some way with these issues okay if you live in a, in in the west and you know and even if you don't you can become a, what's called an interested public in a blm allotment you write and you request to be on the interested public list and then blm is supposed to send you all the documents associated with that allotment when they decide to do something now blm these days has you know increasingly not done anything they just rubber stamp a permit for 10 years grazing permits are for 10 years for, for for 10 years without any doing any environmental analysis but if they do an environmental analysis you can become involved you know and send in comments etc cetera, etc cetera. i mean that's one thing and right now there's this proposal by the trump administration to greatly revise the grazing regulations which would include trying to limit the amount of public involvement and basically pretty much cut the public out of some of these processes under the name of streamlining. But you, but you can get involved, you know, at that level, you can go out and document what's going on, send an email and photos to the BLM and tell them to retain it in their records. So the information is there in the allotment file, ask questions, etc. cetera. You, you may or may or may not get an answer. But at least you're recording what's going on there. You can then, you know, send a copy of that to your elected officials and, you know, complaining letters accompanying that to your elected officials. You know, with some, it might, you know, at least awaken them a little bit. Others, you know, it won't do any good because they're, you know, basically bonded at the hip with the livestock industry. You know, the classic write letters, write op-eds, et cetera try to educate others, you know, like you're trying to do with the podcast or with that, the hoodwinkery article to just basically try to understand what is going on that, and understand the connection between the public lands that we all own and, and all have a, a stake in and their, their value for doing things like trying to ameliorate some of the, you know, the, the some of the stresses of climate change and sequester carbon, et cetera, and that the public land shouldn't be used for commodity production of beef and or, you know, mining by Canadian mining giants, you know, who multinational rapers and pillagers ac across the globe, and that they should be used for, you know, conservation of water and wildlife and everything else. So I don't know of any silver bullet. It's just making noise at every level, I guess. <laughs> Right. Could you tell us a little bit more about your organization and what you do? Yeah, well, Wildland Defense, we've been um, in existence for around five years now and work a lot on public lands grazing. But as we've been talking about, it's not just grazing. It's why are we killing the pinyon juniper trees? Well, we're killing the pinyon juniper trees because uh, we don't want to do anything to really effectively stop the damage being done to sage grouse habitat so we need a scapegoat out there and the ranchers love us killing trees because then there'll be more grass so it's working on you know deforestation projects and it's also working on herbicide spraying on public lands which is a an increasingly huge problem because agencies you know they go out and they tear up the public lands with you know 
sagebrush thinning projects, whatever, and their solution to cheatgrass is to spray herbicide. Well, the herbicide is supposed to suppress the cheatgrass germination. Well, it it stays in the soil for two or three years, maybe. After that, it doesn't do anything. And um, it, it actually suppresses the germination of native plant seeds, too. And by the way, often happens to injure the native plants that are out there, too, even though it's not supposed to. So in reality, you know, it's if you work on public lands grazing, you're, you're working on pretty much everything that goes on on public land. And also biodiversity protection for species like sage grouse and pygmy rabbit and pygmy rabbits and migratory songbirds. Then if, if you're interested in conservation with those species, then you're interested in pretty much everything that goes on in BLM lands because it's sort of, and, and many forest service lands eating into the habitat, like the fuel breaks project. Well, part of that fuel breaks project also involves blading roads that are often two tracks into these big flat expanses. It'll be weed conduits. And so BLM, instead of figuring out other ways to address fire problems in the West, wants to take this sort of in its way, in its way, it's this industrial farming approach and destroy habitats and build bigger roads out there, which is madness, and it will mean more disturbance, more weeds, you name it. So if you work, work on public lands grazing and protection of species, you work on those too. So it's pretty much working on every bad bad idea BLM Forest Service has, which is pretty much every idea they come out with these days. Right. So are you the one who posts to Facebook for Wildlands Defense? Yes, yes. I, I follow you there, and the number of stories that you put out is, is amazing. Uh, the number of things that I wouldn't hear about any other way is impressive, and so I would actually urge people, if they use Facebook, to, to follow you on Facebook as well for that reason. Well, thank you. Yeah, it's, well, it's, it's sort of an outlet for me. You know, It's just like you can only look at some of these agency documents so long, and so it's like almost multitasking tasking or getting distracted and thinking about something else for a while makes you feel a little better, even though it's something really depressing you're working on, you're writing about. <laughs> right, but I really have been quite educated. I, I set you for follow first, uh, which I think people should do with any activist organization whose work they appreciate. It's, it's not their fault, but people in cities just don't have much of an idea of what's going on in the environment because it's really not reported in the in the mainstream media very often, uh, except sometimes at the at the local level. And so people don't have all the the pieces connected for them to see the the big picture like you were uh, able to help explain today. Well, thank you. I want to put in a plug for another another book. I think it's available, you know, online still available online if you want to get into sort of the nitty-gritty of public lands ranching because i don't know if george Worthner's book is still available or not but it was lynn jacobs waste of the west uh he lynn jacobs was from arizona and waste of the west was written i think in the uh 1990s but it goes into detail on a lot almost every issue we've been talking about and really nothing has changed since then it's the same situation, and that's why I, I said there needs to be a revolution, basically, in how we treat our Western public lands and how we deal with ranching and all its Medusa-headed effects and the power. It's the power <laughs> of the ranchers that is so immense that so few people can have so much power and can be ruining so much is really tragic. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much. I think that's a good place to, to end this episode. And thank you very much for uh, joining me today. And I'd love to have you on again in the future. Uh, we can talk more specific things that are happening. But today was a great way of introducing people to all these topics, I think. Okay, great. Thank you. Voices for Nature and Peace is produced in the Gila River Valley, New Mexico, USA, on land that we acknowledge is illegally occupied Apache territory. The intro music is Zero G Yogi by Big Z, with narration by Kelly Moody of the Ground Shots podcast. This outro music is Trip A, also by Big Z. Commercial break narration by Nikki Hill. 
to become a financial supporter of this podcast and to gain access to members-only content, visit patreon.com slash colibri, K-O-L-L-I-B-R-I. For more information on Radio Free Sunroot programming, please visit radiofreesunroot.com. Thank you for listening. May you find joy in your own nature and peace.